right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 18 Avenue with the podcast network that explores new culture and the people who live them daily. I am your host, Rick Bottles. This season, we are exploring the culture of yoga, the methods, the type, the philosophy, and race. This podcast is not for everyone, but if you love real people, real stories, and their culture, you've come to the right place. Uh, this is the second episode for this particular series. Uh, we are releasing an episode every month. Um, so stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, like, comments, and share. Joining us today is our special guest, uh, Kendra Kukling. Um, she is a meditation coach and a multidisciplinary artist out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, I do have Vancouver, British, British Columbia there, I hope. Uh, that's okay. Uh, she practiced and studied yoga for the last seven years. Um, in 2017, Kendra was uh, initiated into the yoga traditions by Swami Vadian. Sorry, I couldn't say that word. <laughs> uh, while studying transformational yoga in uh, South India, Kendra is a certified uh, and registered with um, Yoga Alliance International as a 500 HRYT and T-I-M-E, meditation teacher. I'm here today to talk all about yoga, uh, Kendra Copeland, everybody. How are you doing, Kendra? I'm good today, thank you. Yeah, yeah, welcome. I'm very happy to have you on the show. As you can see, I mispronounced that word there. Uh, how do you pronounce that word, by the way? <laughs> uh, by Swami's name? Uh, Swami, yeah. Swami Vivyanand. Vivyanand, okay, wow. Is, is it Italian? <laughs> no, it's definitely a Sanskrit name. Oh. <laughs> okay. But you know, it's it's Sanskrit is a dead language. It was considered dead at this point, so it's uh, I won't hold it against you if you don't have the pronunciation down perfectly. There's a, most of us don't, <laughs> unless you're a scholar. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's uh, let's start there. What is um, I, I wanted to start with uh, meditation, yoga, and multidisciplinary artists. Do you want to break that down for us? Let's start there. Oh my gosh! Like, where do I even begin to break that down? Um, what? Like, are you asking what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for those of us that really don't speak that type of language on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just yeah, just kind of putting your teeth in that and tearing it apart. Okay. Um, you know, I think I went into um, this practice largely because I was working as an artist. Um, I work as a photographer. And I think for maybe for a lot of artists, as we um, reflect upon our own work, there's like kind of an internal um, process where we have to look at why we create a thing in a particular way or what were all the kind of layers be behind that creation and that really uh, kind of launched me into self-inquiry. And that's kind of the place in which um, meditation now overlaps with my artistry work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I just, I just thought it was so like fascinating. You know, as I was going through your website and, and doing my little research that I could do and I realized there's so much here that we could just talk about. Um, but, you know, as I said to you before, is that one of the places that I like to start just to give the audience uh, some idea of uh, who the guest is and what they're about is, is this question here is, uh, uh, what were you like in, uh, in high school? You know, I, I don't mean to take it back, but I want to take it back. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I was terrible. I was, I, actually, I was, uh, I was, um, uh, I went through, I think, maybe some sort of identity crisis. For a while, I was, like, one of the goth kids. I had, like, the okay. black, you know, <laughs> eyeliner and the combat boots. Oh, and I wow. was in, like, rock and roll concerts mm. and, like, punk shows and in mosh pits. <laughs> it just feels so vastly different from the life that I lead now. Right. Um, yeah, I think um, I was very rebellious. I was a handful. I was a handful. I would not want me as a teenage daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would not, eh? <laughs> I would not. I, don't, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so I don't want to assume. Uh, so your background, 
I know that you live in British Columbia right now, but your background, is it, have you always lived in British Columbia or did you kind of migrate from elsewhere? Like how, how did it all come together? Yeah. So I've lived, I was born and raised here on the unceded Coast Salish territory. Okay. And um, my father's side of the family is from the Caribbean. So okay. he moved here when he married my mother, who is a third generation Canadian. All right. Uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. And my next, uh, my next question would be, is like, you know, when we talk about meditation, like I'm always curious, like what made you want to be a meditation uh, coach? Um, and, you know, and how does that tie in with like yoga? Where did that idea first start? Like you mentioned, you were quite a handful in, uh, in high school. So how do you come from that to saying, you know what, I think I'm going to do something entirely opposite. <laughs> and when did you decide that? You know, I don't know. It was a really long process. And by that, I mean, I was a very rebellious teenager. And I often expressed myself through my art. You know, whether it was like photography or making strange sculptures that I, you know, would have in my bedroom. Um, and it, like, again, was through that process of like expressing myself and then reflecting upon this thing that I had expressed and, you know, trying to make the next art piece and trying to dissect, you know, what was it there that I didn't like about that thing and why did I create a thing in this particular way? And that kind of continual process of uh, self-reflection is what has been like a refining um, piece kind of throughout mm -hmm. my life. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, at times I really struggled with depression, with anxiety, as I went through my own um, process of trying to find who I was and where I fit into, you know, the larger puzzle of life. Right. And um, it is like that the, kind of that sense of not knowing. Just beginning yoga as a as a practitioner, you know. I didn't even necessarily go into it um, with that intention. It was more so that you know I was going into yoga to try a thing, you know, in the search for. Uh, where, where is it that I fit into this puzzle piece right. and that I had a revelation in this practice that I, I don't know, I got a sense of myself on a different level Okay. and began to follow that path. Okay. So did you kind of stumble across yoga or did someone sort of like approach you and say, hey, you know what, let's go take yoga classes together? Um, you know, I think initially I was probably introduced to just mindfulness um, gotcha. and I, I'm, when I try to think back, probably at times when I was really struggling with depression and anxiety, um, just as I kind of went through that sense, trying to find myself in the world and I was, you know, picking up mindfulness exercises. So they were kind of there in the background. And then when I got pregnant with my daughter, I decided to take a prenatal yoga class that was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really enjoyed the practice and I found it really easy to kind of integrate those mindfulness exercises that I had learned in the practice. Mm -hmm. And so I just stuck with it, you know, and I practiced for another, um, I guess six or seven years. And the more I practiced, the more curious I got about it. The more I started to read the history of yoga, the more I started to delve into Vedic texts. And eventually um, I went to Indonesia to study meditation and then went to India to study yoga. That's pretty awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, <clears throat> I, so as you know, like we're in a very interesting time with the pandemic pandemic and everything. And I think one of my question is, uh, how is meditation? Are you still heavily meditation, meditating on a daily basis? And how has that sort of like shaped your mindset? Mm. Yes and no. <laughs> you know, I think as, <clears throat> as my practice has kind of evolved, I don't always, you know, sit down with my legs crossed and my right, you know, right. my hands in in Gaya Mudra and and uh, and have a very like focused meditation. But I do feel 
that the element of meditation is very integrated into my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So that when, um, you know, I'm watching the news and uh, something comes up that feels upsetting, I feel it in my body. I notice And then I'm able to respond um, rather than maybe move into like a state of reaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, re I might watch the news and something upsetting comes up, as I say. And rather than, um, you know, totally shut down or start behaving in some uh, way that lacks self-awareness, I can maybe take a moment and breathe and tend to that feeling. Right. And so that's what I mean by my meditation practice feels more integrated. I feel like I'm more present in my whole life on the day to day on, on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. um, but I might only sit down for uh, an hour, half an hour. It's not like I'm sitting down multiple hours a day trying to meditate and right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. through the pandemic, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to survive. The, uh, the current time, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so do you enjoy teaching? I do very much so. I, okay. And it's funny because I never wanted to be a teacher. You know, <laughs> when I went into yoga, it was for purely selfish reasons. I was like, I was finding myself and then I was like, I got this idea in my head, I'm going to self-liberate, you know, like I'm going to, reach full enlightenment and that became my only goal right. and um and that was my only goal for a really long time and that's largely why i went to you know travel and went to indonesia went to india to do this practice to study mm -hmm. um but the more i studied the more i realized that my liberation is actually tied to the liberation of others and that if i don't share my knowledge and i don't share my wisdom then um I'm actually not going to be able to reach liberation because my beingness in the world is interwoven with the beingness of all. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, like I said, I went into this kind of for selfish reasons and, um, and I was really resistant to teaching, but um, the more that I teach, the more that I learn and the more that um, I see a community of people grow and I see how that affects the whole community around me and so I really do enjoy teaching now and I and I feel really grateful for the opportunity to share these practices and this wisdom with other people yeah yeah it, it must be an amazing feeling to have to pay that knowledge for in a sense is that is that kind of how you you feel now that this is something this is what you do now full-time this is your career now yeah yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about photography and uh, reclamation session. I, I felt that was, uh, I, I seen that on your website and I said, I want to break into that. So as you mentioned before, you were a photographer prior to going into like yoga or was it kind of like, okay. So how do you now use uh, photography and meditation together? How, how does those two merge to form one world to say yeah so a couple of different ways like i said i still i still actually work full-time as a photographer as well okay um so the ways in which it merges is that sometimes i'll use photography as a tool to teach with so teaching people you know self-portraiture and then a way of reflecting upon what it is that we see when we take a photo of ourselves so sometimes that might look like teaching people um how to set up camera and lighting and things like that so that they can express themselves in however they want mm -hmm. and then reflect back upon that in the reclamation sessions and in the mirroring sessions that I offer um, and in the bed sessions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I provide that mirror for people. So people who don't want to take their own photos, I'll take photography for them. I give them space to express themselves. However, that looks. And then I provide them back with these photographs, which act as like a totem for where they are at that particular point in their life. Okay. And there's an opportunity for people to sit down in meditation afterwards and be with whatever comes up from those photographs. So oftentimes I'm photographing people who are either going through life transitions. That might mean that they've just had a baby or um, maybe they've just gone through a divorce or something like that. 
and we'll reflect upon what they see in that photograph together. Uh, so um, my guess would be that doing that session, um, it'll be sort of, does that individual then go into character per se to kind of like relive that experience that they previously had to, um, so that someone, what, someone looking at the images later on can really feel that sense of emotion and where they may be at that very moment? Is that kind of like the idea? No, so I wouldn't okay. want people to um, like create some sort of fake persona or anything like that. Gotcha. I'm there to act like a mirror. So okay. people are already going through that process, you know, whether or not they finalize the papers on their divorce, it doesn't just happen in a day. It's like a process that happens over a period of time. Okay. And so I just show up for one of those days in that time period and reflect where they're at or photograph where they're at today. Gotcha. And so as I go into that session, I'm looking to build um, trust and repertoire with that client to give them the space that they can begin to open up and express themselves in a way that feels authentic. Right. And then I'm documenting that. And right. even when people are unable to show up in their own authenticity, something does emerge, you know, mm -hmm. even that can be something worth looking at as to why it was difficult to allow the walls to come down and to allow oneself to be seen. All right. Um, so there was something else I also seen on your, on your site as well. You're very, you're, you're like this individual, you have a huge catalog of things that you are interested in. Like when we uh, talk about sexual violence, for instance, um, uh, gentrifications and uh, the misappropriation, like how, let me, let me word this better. <laughs> um, how did you, where, where did it start? It was just going back to like sexual violence, for instance, where, where did it start for you? What, what sort of like, you know, rooted your interest in that to begin with? Is it something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you know, it's not every I mean, I day. I, I laugh because it's like, uh, it's not like I just took up interest in sexual violence. I was sexually assaulted, you know? Okay. Um, and I was sexually assaulted as a child. And so I think that that played a role from very early on in my sense of self of feeling like maybe there was something wrong with me or that, um, or just confusion around like what my sexuality was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Was I, was I allowed to express myself sexually or does that put me at risk then of more violence? So there was kind of like um, a disconnect from my body, which happened at the point of that trauma. And so, um, like I said, in this practice, kind of as I've delved deeper into it, there's been an opportunity to self-reflect and to reflect on um, the larger climate of violence mm -hmm. that we have, you know, globally in our communities. Um, and that's kind of how, um, you know, as, I, as I've sat with and unpacked you know, done many therapy sessions. <laughs> um, I've, I, I feel that there's a great opportunity now to use these practices, trauma collectively, to begin to address um, some of the very difficult um, feelings that arise when we talk about sexual violence and to begin to create a yeah to collectively create a pathway forward out of it is it is it hard um to talk about now since this is something that you experience firsthand how hard is it to sort of um talk about it now or have you come to terms with it and your goal now is to help others um you know i think trauma is complex i don't think like you know i have days where um where I feel more activated talking about it mm -hmm. because, you know, maybe I'm witnessing it in the news and it's bringing up some feelings or, um, or I'm t talking with another survivor and their experience feels really similar to mine. And so it can touch on, um, on tender parts that make it more challenging to talk about. But on the whole, I feel like, um, these are conversations we need to have. 
because sexual violence happens because we're not having them. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, being able to share that knowledge uh, with others and have them come forward. Uh, do you get a lot of people that sort of, you know, want to come forward with these things, whether it's in sort of privacy or, you know, in like a group settings? Do you get a lot of women that want to come forward or even men? Um, you know, I don't, how do I wear this? Um, I think, yes, in that I put myself out there and host, you know, workshops and, um, and classes and things like that for specifically centered around survivors of sexual violence. That said, we don't delve into the story around people's individual traumas mm -hmm. because I find that that actually isn't necessarily helpful to like go in looking to relive an experience and to drudge it up mm -hmm. and, to sh and to share it. That isn't always helpful for people. But what can be helpful is noticing what's still here in this moment. So, you know, when we go into, for example, a yoga nidra practice and I have a room full of survivors and people are having a hard time closing their eyes because they don't feel safe in their body to make space for that and to acknowledge that because right. that's what's real in that moment. Right. And then to give people the options and be like, do you want to keep your eyes open or do you want to close them? Either is actually okay. And to allow people to kind of get settled in their own bodies in their own time. So um, that's kind of more what the practice looks like. Not <laughs> rather than like people coming to me and being like, this was the trauma I experienced. And um, yeah, because I find that a lot of survivors aren't really interested necessarily in delving into that story. Many times they've said their story quite a few times, maybe haven't been heard, hasn't been received well. So people aren't always um, super, uh, sort of like for they're not, uh, they're not always anxious to share their traumas. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I kind of went there because uh, my last guest, we were talking about uh, uh, trauma, and she, you know, kind of, you know, maybe understand um, when it initially happened and how yoga came into her life. You know. I haven't come from that background and she just needed something. Thankfully, there was somebody there who, who was able to be instrumental in sort of bringing her to yoga and being able to find peace. So she is now um, a teacher, which is why I kind of brought that up. Uh, so uh, going into the next question here, um, as a teacher, what are your, what are your goals? <laughs> yeah, I have pickles. I'm like liberate the world. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yes. <laughs> liberate all people. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> that's my only goal. <laughs> By any means necessary. No. But and I like that. I like that. A little bit of Malcolm X in there. I like that. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, let's see here. Another question. Uh, what transformation can people expect when they practice meditation? <laughs> it depends on how deep you want to go into that practice. You know, I think, okay. you know, I could sit here and close my eyes and watch my breath and, and go nowhere <laughs> in my practice. I could do that same thing and, and keep it very shallow and stay there for many years. Right. But I think very deep radical transformation is possible for those who are willing to look very deeply. So in other words, it doesn't happen for anyone. It happens to individual that really give it their all and then really um, sort of, I don't want to use the word belief, but I guess that's the only thing that comes to mind. Like individual who really wants to be vulnerable and give themselves a way to that. Is that what you're trying to say? I think it just takes really strong determination because okay. it's very, when we sit here, you know, and we were like, I'm just going to watch the breath come in and out. Eventually, boredom arises. Eventually, frustration arises. <laughs> you can lose it and watch right. that breath along. And that is where we have the opportunity then to look, right? Mm. But a lot of people hit that surface emotion. I'm frustrated. And then they stop and they get up and they go. And they can say, oh, I meditate, you know, half an hour every day. But they quit at that point in which right. the frustration begins to arise. The boredom arises. Right. You never 
bring to the practice. And so I think it takes, you know, a particular level of determination to sit with yourself long enough for your own wisdom to arise. Right. And, you, and, and I believe like you're not supposed to sort of, not that you're not supposed to, but I was reading that um, when you meditate, you're really, the objective is to sort of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the objective is to sort of um, accept um, your surrounding and try not to think, just be in that moment and, and really commit. Is that, is that kind of like the idea around that or? To try not to think? Yeah, to... I, mean, I don't know that that's possible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least try to focus on, like, one thing. Part. I mean, it's, it's hard. I tried it so many times, and I don't know. I think there's something wrong with me. <laughs> I, I've i tried not to think for about 10 years, and I don't, I am, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the thoughts come in is what it is, more so. And we have an option is that we can engage with our thoughts, and then we can allow them to carry us into a story. Mm-hmm. Or we can notice that the thoughts are there and we can kind of switch from this role from being engaged with the thought to being the observer of right. the thought. And when we're in that state of observing, then we're in the state of being. Gotcha. If that, if that makes sense. You know, when we're, yeah. when we're caught in the actual thought and we're like, oh, this person didn't call me back. They never call me back. They really don't care about me. <laughs> you know, we follow that whole story and we can create a whole world. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> But we can also notice, the other option is, I'm noticing that there's frustration because I didn't receive the call back. And I'm noticing that there's a thought here that wants to come up to create a whole story around why I didn't receive the call back. Mm -hmm. And I'm noticing that like there's a tightness in my chest and I'm feeling some tension because I've not received the call back. So we, can, we have options. And that is being present. Wow, it's just it's so it's so intense and and like because you almost have to be aware of everything that's going on and you have to be the critic as well as be the subject in that moment um, and try to correct things as you go along to really get the result that you're looking for. Um, one time, I think it was an elementary school, and we had this uh, hypnotist come uh, come over. And uh, he was able to hypnotize everybody. I just come from Africa at the time. So, you know, we don't, we don't know anything about hypnotizing. You can't hypnotize me. So I closed my eyes. Of course, I was not, I, I did not have the same experience uh, as some of the classmates, you know. I, and I guess that was just, it just kind of stemmed from that, um, uh, that really for me, that experience. Um, what? What much mantras do you like to use, if any? What mantras? Yeah. Um, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of a hard question to answer. I don't know that there's like, <laughs> like mantra is, just means sacred sound. And so I guess all of them. <laughs> I, I, gosh, um, I guess like the most <laughs> simple one would be just uh, so harm, which is I am that. I am that which is. And that's probably the most simple one. And I come back to that, you know, again and again. Um, but I also do some bhakti practices. So um, I might sing particular mantras to welcome in a particular type of energy or wisdom mm -hmm. to arise within myself and call that forward. Mm -hmm. And I find those types of practice is really helpful as well. Okay. And here we are. I have to keep zooming into the screen. I should have just had a notebook here. <laughs> 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 um, what I, now we're going to do some student uh, questions here. What I, some of, you know, since you are a uh, coach and I'm sure you get these a lot, uh, what are some of the questions that perhaps students ask you or what's the ones that really stand out that is like the constant thing or first thing that they may ask you? The first thing people ask. Um, let me think about that for a second. Yeah. 
you know, I think I, I get <laughs> one of two types of questions. One mm-hmm. is that people tend to ask me for relationship advice all the time. <laughs> and I always oh. find that really fascinating, you know, that um, people are looking for me to provide them with a particular type of wisdom. And, and I always end up redirecting them within themselves because I don't know their relationships. and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Um, but oftentimes people have like a sense of or lack of clarity from within and what they're really looking for is like, how do I find that clarity? Right. It might be more helpful than to offer students a practice that will allow them to self reflect in a way that maybe they hadn't before. Mm -hmm. The other type of question I get is how do I stop thinking? And uh, very much like I had said earlier. And I that's just, not, that's not possible. You have to. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's the function of the brain, right? The brain right. is like a computer. It receives information in and then it translates it into this has this particular meaning. You know, this thing is unsafe. This thing is safe. It, right. it tracks all of our information, all of the things we see and hear and smell and taste and feel. And that log so its job is to constantly analyze. That's what it's doing. Right. So it's it, that trying to stop that process is like trying to, oh, I'm just going to stop my heart from beating. I'm just going to stop breathing. <laughs> this is the thing it's supposed to do. Yeah. So, so also observe it without attaching the sense of like, I like it or I don't like its process right now. Wow. Yeah, it's always, I feel like as human sometime i guess the answer is always there for us really whatever it is that we're going through um because we know firsthand we are the one having that experience as human we must we know the answer we sometimes even think about it because it plays in our consciousness often but i guess we want to hear it from someone who we believe is an expert and who can kind of give us that cue is kind of like which is, is that how you sort of like process it when, when these things come about? You know, very much so. I think you know, I was always very curious about religion and spirituality growing up. It was just, you know, I, I we didn't go to church growing up and I was just very curious to know what was this calling. And um, I often laugh that like I went all the way to India to try to find God and I found myself. <laughs> And I didn't have to actually travel that far. To find God? <laughs> to find, yeah, because I found that like, I actually have all of my answers within me and I can connect on that spiritual level with myself at any point. Right. I can connect to the larger um, consciousness, the larger body of consciousness at any point. And I can do it from anywhere, from my living room, you know, from the grocery store. But I went all the way to India in search of this thing, Amazing. as I think many people do. And, um, yeah, I just, I think what a lot of people are looking for is for somebody to give them the answer, you know, and I often kind of equate um, this meditation practice to being like, it feels often like I was on an airplane and I was traveling along and everything was fine. And then I get up from my seat and I look in the cockpit and there's no pilot. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought I was, I thought someone was flying the plane. But it turns out it's just me. And now I have to learn how to fly the plane. I like that analogy. It's very overwhelming, you know? Right. um, In in a lot of ways, meditation is wonderful because it's given me my, uh, it's, it's, it's given me my autonomy back. Because when I'm self-aware, when I'm aware what's happening in my body, when I'm aware what's happening in my mind, I then can choose. Right? When we're not aware of what's happening in our body and our mind, it's very hard to make decisions from a clear place. Right. And so that we look to outside sources to help us navigate that. Right. Which makes it even harder and impossible because it all comes down to um, um, self, uh, self-awareness, self-discipline. Yeah. No, 100%, 100%. I, I think that's like very, uh, very important um, on, on so many levels. And, and what you say is really up to us to recognize what the answer is versus what the answer isn't. And well, I think it's more so that there's just a lot of people out there willing to exploit that, right? The people know that 
people are not self-aware. They're not they're not connected with themselves very deeply. Okay. And so they can exploit that. You know, they can say, "Oh, if you <laughs> buy this product for a low, low price, if you sign up for these wellness classes, oh, those price, guys, <laughs> then, then you'll be able yeah. to connect very deeply with yourself, and then you'll be able to find clarity as to why." you're in these relationship cycles or why you're behaving in this way. And that's why I say like, I, you know, in this practice, I'm always directing students back into the self because that wisdom is actually already there. And, you know, in the scriptures, they say that it very much is like looking into a, a dirty mirror, you know, and it's like a process of kind of wiping the mirror clear until we can see our reflection very clearly. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes I feel like the work that I'm doing is redirecting people to their own mirror <laughs> and reminding them, just keep a little more Windex, you know? Are you, are, you, um, are you afraid that you may be one of the only people that redirect, that, you know, that forces people to think that way? Because um, the, other, the other side of the spectrum is that there's so many things around us and so many, you know, organizations, so many bodies people willing to offer um solution for whatever it is we're, we're going through you know you go from the beauty magazines for instance oh you don't feel well where well, this is what you must do the mm-hmm. television the constant i mean i don't know what this word is going to be like in the next 20 years or where we're going to what exactly we're going to be doing the other day i seen a robot police dog so uh <laughs> So, I mean, there's always solution being offered to us. And here you are asking people to do the one thing that they never even thought of they could do. (laughs) You know, I think think the reason that we have all of these things is out of avoidance for doing the one thing that we should be doing. (laughs) Right, right, because they've been offering it to us. They said... You don't want to deal with it, we will fix it for you so you, that you don't have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very easy to sell that <laughs> as an option. I've bought it, you know, <laughs> I've bought it many times. <laughs> we oftentimes feel that it's too easy or it's like too, we're being too lazy to sit and be with ourselves mm-hmm. rather than, you know, distract ourselves with all of the things of life. Um, and the other part is, is, is once we do sit down, it's actually very hard to just be with ourselves. <laughs> so um, it, it's it's a tough it's a tough sell, <laughs> you know. And, and I <laughs> yeah. don't I don't think that there's a lot of people out there doing it. But that being said, there's enough out there doing it because I've had the opportunity to learn from people. You know, had an opportunity to sit with uh, Swami Vivyanand. I've had the opportunity to sit with Sally Kempton. And of course, there's many teachers before me uh, through a long lineage who have sat with themselves and then sat with students and provided this wisdom. And each of those students then has carried even tiny bits of that out and into the world in how they, you know, navigate their own personal lives and interact with the people in their communities and so on and so forth. So I do think it happens. I just don't think it happens um, maybe at the scale that, you know, yet <laughs> that, um, that would, you know, be, um, that would like change the world overnight. But at the same time, I, I do see a rising of consciousness. You know, I'm seeing in every generation more self-awareness, more awareness of what's happening in the world, um, you know, even the other day, my daughter, <laughs> she uh, drew this picture of a ladybug. Okay. And I was like, oh, he's so cute. And my daughter is like, this is a gender neutral ladybug. They use they, them pronouns. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're right. I didn't ask what pronouns right. your ladybug use. Like, I didn't think of that. Huh. But certainly at nine years old, that wasn't in my radar. And so I think consciousness as it emerges is... folds away like petals unfold on a flower so it can't really be rushed and and uh i don't know that we're gonna have like a a million you know fully enlightened people spring up overnight i think it's like people will slowly become more self-aware and they will pass that on and their children will be more self-aware and they'll pass that on yeah yeah 
I think that's a that's a great um, thought. And and mentioning your daughter, you, you know. And I remember being young. When you're so young, the world is a magical place, and that you are the magician. You you your your level of creativity is just skyrocketing. And then as you get older, uh, you know things starts to be taken apart, right? And arrival in front of you, and you start to develop a new sense of self, a new sense of importance, and how you need to be, and things like that. And creativity sort of starts to take the, you know, the the the, the back door, um, almost, or the back seat. Um, if, if we can put it that way, do you think that, because I feel like we all been there, do you think that um, at some point, you know, I know we're hopeful that the world would be a, a become a better place and it is, you know, it's getting better. It's better in many ways than what it used to be from, from the old days, but in terms of consciousness, um, do you think that we're going to come to a point where we're going to have to rely on ourselves and recognize that we need to rely on ourselves if we want to get better or we want to become a better person or whatever it is that we're pursuing in that moment? Or is it going to get to a point where um, now that we've been fed so many things and we've gotten super, super laid back and super, super lazy at this point, um, do you just think that, you know, we're just eventually going to have something else that's going to replace and it's going to give us whatever? I mean, I don't mean to bring this up, but there was an article that I was reading um, like a while back about um, men that no longer, the people that no longer want to be in a relationship. And so they have these uh, sex dolls, right? And they're quite content with them. Like they dress them up. They have an entire household full. Of them. That's somebody that's saying he's decided, look, I've been divorced twice, whatever the situation may be, and I just don't want to deal with a human being. So I'm going to take this non-living being and make it mine. <laughs> I mean, talk about problems and solution. Right. You know, I think the very, um, the mind is a very tricky thing. The mind is a very tricky thing and the ego is a very tricky thing. It can convince us of all sorts of solutions, you know, of all sorts of like, um, it gives us the illusion of reality, no matter where we point our attention. Mm -hmm. So I could say, oh, yoga is the only path and <laughs> you, know, you have to do the asana this particular way and stand on your head in this particular way. And right. that is the thing that we'll do. But the thing is that like, life itself is constant movement is constant evolution anytime that we um lock ourselves into a particular belief system we can be sure that the ego has arisen <laughs> you know mm. and it, and it is, it is 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 acting as disillusionment so you know in the example you're giving of this person saying oh i just if i just get a sex doll i don't have to deal with people it's like this very um, I, I guess like it's, it's not even a sex doll that's, that is necessarily a problem, but it's that finite or that that um, permanent Thank idea. Mm -hmm. This idea that like it cannot be any other way. It has to be like It has this. to be this way. That, that, is a, that is a problem. And it's not that I think that um, people will either like it's, it's not, I don't think it's so like black and white in that people will either find half will will like find themselves and and become more self aware or go into deep isolation and, and individualism. I think sometimes that is the path to the other side. It's mm -hmm. like people need to go down a very long tunnel into themselves sometimes before emerging into a larger awareness. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I think like, I mean, like that, that's one very specific example. And people have all sorts of reasons as to why they may or may not want to use a sex doll. You know, <laughs> it's complex. Like humans are not one dimensional. So while one person may have this inanimate 
uh, you know, thing to connect with because they don't want to talk to humans. Somebody else may use one for a totally different reason. And so it's difficult for me to say that that is proof that all of humanity is going in one direction that we're going deep into individualism. Mm -hmm. I think some of us will. And in that process, find that we actually are not happy there. Mm -hmm. We'll get far enough down that road that it will be too uncomfortable to stay there. And there will be no other option, but to turn around and come back to the self. Mm. But the farther you travel that road, the longer the journey is home. Uh, absolutely. The, the journey is home. So, you know, my advice to people is to turn around now. <laughs> <laughs> Do it as quickly as you can. And turn the attention back inward here. <laughs> yeah. So now that you mentioned that, and I know that you are, you're very passionate, um, because you two have experienced this, but I want to throw this um, explanation to you. So with the sex doll situation, uh, one of the explanation that was given as to why this has become a 20, 30 million dollars industry and growing mm -hmm. was that it was going to minimize or somehow either minimize or eliminate um sexual violence to world <laughs> to world women <laughs> so let's just actually make them real objects you know <laughs> let's not acknowledge the humanity of no 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 let's yeah all. let's just make objects so that we can masturbate on right but this yeah this was the scientist scientific explanation for why it has become and it has to be this way and i was like this is crazy your take on that <clears throat> like i said i think people will convince themselves of all sorts of things you know in order to avoid having to do the work <laughs> you know sitting with like all the discomfort that arises from recognizing how misogyny and how um uh gendered violence operates in the world like that is that is not a comfortable thing to sit with we do all sorts of things to distract, to get away from having to sit with what, we, what really comes up when mm -hmm. we acknowledge that piece, when we acknowledge the suffering of others, right? So it's easier to say, oh, we just create this object and that will solve the problem. <laughs> then I don't have to sit with these like really uncomfortable feelings and right. we don't have to unpack that. But of course, when we sit and for a long time and we unpack that, is that going to stop people from raping is that going to stop people from pedophilia is that going to stop sex trafficking from happening no that will still happen and will it solidify ideas around the objectivity of the body to look at any human body as an object of pleasure rather than like the very complex you know, structure that it is right you know a body of emotions of feelings of experiences like a whole human voices is attached to that a yeah. whole life is attached to that and so i think if we don't acknowledge and honor that however that looks whether it's through sex dolls whether it's through you know um billionaires using human bodies as ways to generate income for themselves and not acknowledging you know that there are actual people's lives that people actually suffer right then you know, like I said, the mind, the mind will convince itself of all sorts of things. It will justify any behavior for you. Yeah. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> it's going back to mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I have this question. Uh, how can someone, and I think we've already covered uh, this similarly. But I will ask it again just to clarify. Um, how can someone use mindfulness and loving kindness every day? <clears throat> how can someone use mindfulness? And... I'm teaching a class right now, and um, <clears throat> it's on spiritual wellness for black bodies. And in it, I talk a bit about... Um, what the word holy means, you know, holy comes from an old English word, which means um, it's halig is the word. <clears throat> and that comes from another word of Indo-European origin, which means whole and well. 
it means like wellness. So the word, what, what is holy is that which makes us whole and well. Um, and so when I think about like mindfulness, loving kindness, spiritual practices, they are the things which oftentimes lead to wholeness, to uh, wellness. So I think that people can use these practices as tools to create wellness, to create um, a sense of wholeness within themselves without having to reach to outside objects, without having to reach to um, even other relationships in order to create a sense of wellness. Okay. It, you, can, you can do it in just a few minutes in a day, starting with yourself. And I think that that helps to break the cycle of this constant outward, you know, of our attention constantly going outwards mm -hmm. in search of things which will fulfill us, you know, a fulfilling career of, you know, to have uh, a certain type of clothing, a certain type of housing, a certain diet plan. You know, we're always looking outward for these things to, to fill us up. But I think right. that we can use mindfulness and loving kindness as a way to put something in the bucket that originates from within. Yeah. Do you believe that as long as we continue to reach out for our solution, um, we may never really, we may not eventually come to the solution that we really need? <laughs> yeah, that's a very complex question to ask a yogi. <laughs> I think that it is the nature for the attention to go outward. I think that we can choose self-awareness and bring it back inward at any point. And like I said before, the longer it goes outward, the longer it takes to come back inward. I think that or it is my belief that consciousness is happening in all bodies simultaneously and consciousness itself is the thing which is reaching out. It wants to know its own bounds. It's reaching out through your experience. It's reaching out through my experience. And it's unbiased as to whether or not you like it. Right. <laughs> and whether or not I'm enjoying that process, right. you know. Um, but we can interrupt at any point and turn the attention and come back inward. And so, yeah, I don't... <sighs> I don't necessarily have like feelings as to whether that's a good or bad process. It just is. It is something which is happening. Right. Um, and it's happening at different speeds <laughs> through different bodies right. for different lengths of time. Yeah. It just is. is that, I don't know. That maybe that doesn't answer the question. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your answer is as good as mine. So um, I was talking to, or at least having a conversation. So there's a portion of this podcast where I have this, uh, this little game. It's like one or two questions kind of game type mm -hmm. of deal. And basically how it works is, um, um, I, I throw out, uh, scenarios and you kind of like, you know, sort of tell me how certain individual or the, of the past or present would fit into today's society. And interestingly, this is not a tough game at all. Um, Interestingly, a friend of mine was having a discussion the other day about uh, Gandhi mm -hmm. and uh, and perhaps how he would fit into this world. And, uh, you know, w and it was a different time then. Um, so the, the, the first question I want to ask you is how you are here today. We weren't here back then. How would Gandhi fit into today's society given everything that is happening, would he have the same impact he had? Well, I think, first of all, I don't know enough about Gandhi to answer that question. I don't know Gandhi's life story. I'm not a follower of Gandhi. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not, I can't be qualified to answer that. But I do know very small parts about Gandhi. Um, and I think that a lot of the complexities of the man as a whole being were ignored because of the work that he was doing. And I think that we're in a time where we are becoming more and more critical of that. You know, for example, I've heard um, that Gandhi also um, sexually assaulted, that Gandhi also um, was uh, 
committed acts of domestic violence against his own wife. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, if Gandhi were alive here, we would be more critical and less likely to, um, or at least what I see happening with a lot of gurus and a lot of teachers is that um, people are sweeping it less and less under the rug to be like, look at the overarching story of what all the good this person is doing and we'll just ignore all of the harm this person is doing. I think that we would maybe look at Gandhi as a, as a more complex human being mm -hmm. and acknowledge that this person um, on the one hand has done some good things and on the one hand has caused some harm. And so we need to be mindful and critical about the information we're receiving from this person. I think that's a very good take. So that's a very good take. Um, another, I mean, like I said, I don't know much about Gandhi. I, just I know. know. I, very little about. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're, we're going to move on to the next, um, the next character. Uh, this one is actually still alive. And I'm not sure if you're, I, I assume that you are. Um, Side Guru. Have you heard the name? His name is Side Guru. He is a meditation uh, a teacher. Um, how uh, have you heard the name before? So you, you cut out there and I missed the name completely. Yeah, I know. We keep cutting out somehow. Eh? Every now and again, things get lost. Um, so the name is Side Guru. Side Guru. Side Guru? Side Guru. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I guess my question is, with what you practice, given your practices, all the different classes you teach, mm -hmm. where would he um, sort of fit in to it? In, in the classes that I teach? In the classes that you teach. He would fit in nowhere because I don't know him. I don't know any of his teachings. <laughs> I, you know, I'm probably the worst person. You got to ask me a big name. Like, where would... Okay, uh, all right. Where, let, where, let, where would Jesus fit in? Where would Martin all right. Luther King fit in? <laughs> let, okay, let's, let's go to that. Then. Let's go to that. Okay, let's go to a big name. Because the reason I'm asking this is that you don't hear about a lot of uh, spiritual uh, leaders anymore. When you hear about them, you literally have to go searching. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, they're not the front of the magazines. Right. They're just yeah. not. Right. Um, so, all right, let's let's do two characters. Let's do Malcolm X and Marco Gavi. You're familiar with Marco Gavi, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm probably the worst person to play this game with because I spend like I, I spend so much of my time going inward. I don't I don't. I don't you don't go outward. All right. Well, let's do. Let's do. Um, yeah. Let's do Malcolm X and Oprah Winfrey. That, see, those are two big names. Malcolm X and Oprah. Where were they fit in right now? Where they yeah. are? I mean, um, I think that... <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't believe that we're so far beyond racism that Malcolm X in this day and age would not still be assassinated. <laughs> you know, I think... <laughs> I think Malcolm X would probably still be in the grave because we've not yet arrived to a place where we're collectively those who are in positions of power can tolerate what he had said. I don't think we, like, it's been, you know, not that long. It hasn't, yeah. And I think we like to disillusion ourselves and believe like, oh, we've come so far. But, you know, you just ask any individual white person the ways in which they perpetuate racism, they will be the first to tell you, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> not me. As an individual, I'm different. But, right. you know, every single one of them feels that way individually. Right. And yet we still see, you know, mass incarceration. We still see Donald Trump as president. We're still seeing um, white people walk into uh, museums armed with assault rifles during a pandemic, demanding that they get a chance to walk around while black people are, you know, uh, taking up or receiving 90% of the... Um, arrests and fines for not social distancing in New York. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. So, and yeah, and possibly. I don't think we've yeah. arrived to a place where like Malcolm X would, would receive some different ends. Okay. What, what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to have to get you back on the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, this is just uh, the first series I initially started uh, podcasting in January and uh, I 
just did whatever at the time that I wanted to do. And so um, after doing several episodes, I decided that, okay, since I'm a man of many curiosities, it's the only way I can describe myself. Um, I break them up into seasons and episodes, just like the TV show. You know, run this session for a while. When that's done, with, we'll move on to the next session. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of things that um, I, you know, I would talk about on any given day that you hold the same view with. So, and that's what I mean by being able to bring you back here uh, on the show uh, sometime in the future. And hopefully, hopefully it's a face-to-face. You know, this, this whole Zoom thing, this is different. <laughs> You know, face to face is much better, and um, and yeah. So hopefully by then it's it's a face to face. Um, so before we go now, because we're running out of time here, I want you to tell us uh, where where the audience can find you, uh, the programs and um, uh, things that you the retreat that you have coming up. Okay. Well, I don't have a retreat coming up, but I can tell okay. you where to find me. <laughs> Um, so you can find me on my website, which is www.kendracopeland, uh, C-O-U-P-L-A-N-D.com. Or you can find me on Instagram um, at instagram.com slash Kendra Copeland. Facebook is the same thing, facebook.com slash Kendra Copeland. So any of those um, locations, you can find my work online. And um, currently I'm running, like I said, a, a wellness program. So it's a six-week program called Spiritual Wellness for Black Bodies. It's where I think we're in their third week now. And we practice um, meditation, doing yoga nidra, and some sound healing through mantra uh, on Sundays. And then on Wednesdays, we do a Hatha yoga practice, and we have a community conversation about what wellness looks like in the black community. Um, so that's happening twice a week right now. And then once that, that session ends, I'll, I'll probably revisit it and look at another time in which I can start that up again. But as of right now, I don't have anything in the works. Um, yeah. Do you have any final words? Do I have any final words? Oh, yes. just thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. Thank you so much for just having me on the show and, um, and sharing this conversation. And it's been really lovely to share more about the practice and not just uh, delve into it, you know? Right. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, that's, that's good. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank you um, for coming to the show. I know it's super, super, super early over there. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I want to thank you all for tuning in to 18th Avenue, the podcast, um, the podcast network about exploring new culture. And this season, of course, once again, this is season two. We are exploring the culture of yoga. And today guess it's um just extraordinary uh kendra kendra copeland uh a meditation coach uh thank you all for joining us and we will see you the next episode once again just as a quick reminder there we release episode once a month um so stay tuned if you have any questions any inquiries make sure to inbox us and also make sure to uh uh look up kendra especially for those of you if you're ever in the uh british vancouver british columbia area or it doesn't even have to be because now the way things are working you can practice from within your home and everything has become very uh (laughs) virtual at this point so uh, so yeah, so make sure to go to her website. I mean, she offer a lot of amazing things that uh, you, you know, you and I can benefit from. And I want to thank you all for joining us on this um, series um, on 18 Avenue Podcast. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time.